Good afternoon, everyone, to the final plenary of the CCIH conference. My name is David Olson. I'm a board member of CCIH and a professional communicator. Uh, I'm an independent global health communications consultant. Uh, I'm delighted to be sharing the stage with uh, my fellow communicators and storytellers. Uh, they all have that in common, but they are uh, diverse in many ways, as you'll find out. I'm going to quickly uh, introduce them very quickly because you have their bios in the program. Uh, John Donnelly on the left is the communications advisor for the president of the World Bank, Jim Kim. Um, Adrian Kerrigan is the senior vice president for advancement of Catholic Medical Mission Board, where he manages private fundraising and communications. And Rebecca Shore is a communication specialist with Johns Hopkins University Center for Communication Programs, Knowledge for Health Project. Uh, before we talk a little bit to each of the panelists, I have one question I want to open up to the group, to whoever wants to answer, which I think will be of particular in interest to all of you um, who are managing communications uh, at probably small faith-based organizations. And that question is, uh, what can you do at a small organization uh, with communications, um, um, especially ones without a lot of financial resources or human resources? Um, this is for anybody. Well, I think when we, uh, I was going to do a little slides later and you'll see, get the scope of our organization. We're big global health organization with 500 employees worldwide. But when you drill down, there's 50 in the United States, and then there's five that work in advancement. And of the five that work in advancement, we have one digital person, two fundraisers. And so it becomes a small organization when you think about it. There's lots of things you can do. And I think the, the premise for today's discussion about stories is the way you can get traction by finding the right stories in your organization personalizing it and building that relational model with your potential donors, your partners, and your friends. So I think as we go on, that'll be the, the key piece. Anyone else? Well, I can talk. Um, I had a slide about this too later. I don't know if we'll get to it. But um, in terms of social media and new media, and I think it applies to all communications, um, I think you really have to focus on what you can do, what you have to work with. Um, and have a real plan. Um, don't just go into it thinking, okay, we'll just add a bunch of different platforms, we'll send out a million brochures, we'll send out four newsletters a month. Really think about what your resources are and how best to reach your population. Um, if they're not online, then online's probably the wrong way. Um, but you know, really thinking through your plan, having a goal when you start out, and really deciding what best to work with. One platform, one way to communicate could be your best way if you can really invest in yeah, I think that's great advice, actually. So I think you start with what your overall objective is for the plan. But then, then you have to think about stories um, and how your stories and your organizations can really advance toward those goals. You have to find great stories of what you do, very personal stories. Um, and, and you can tell them in so many different ways. Um, it's great to hear from people in the field. Um, it's great to, to hear from, from people far away to give who have visited those areas to give perspectives. But, um, but as long as you fit it into, into where you're going for the next year, next two years, and then, and then fill in your own stories. Great. Well, thank you. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk, we're going to talk to each of the panelists briefly, and hopefully we'll have enough time at the end to take any questions you might have. Now, I was remiss when I introduced John Donnelly very briefly, not to mention that he's now the author of A Twist of Faith, An American Christian's Quest to Help Orphans in Africa. And um, I would strongly encourage you to read this. I read it in the last few days, and uh, I, I loved it because it was a, a, a story about an amazing man, but it was also an analysis of 
faith-based work in AIDS in Africa, particularly orf work with orphans. Um, so uh, I would encourage you to, to read that book. And that's my first question to John, which is what inspired you to, to write the book um, and how did that happen? Thanks, David, um, and that's very kind of you. So I, um, I was a reporter for many years. I was based in Africa uh, for the Boston Globe, and um, many of my colleagues in Africa actually um, decided to write, to write books about their time uh, there. And um, I had this very uh, allergic reaction almost to, to it. I thought uh, a lot of them were self-serving and a lot about them, and they just didn't really add up to much. So I left Africa. Um, uh, I came back to the States, reported from Washington. Um, I still, though, wanted to cover um, uh, AIDS and global health issues, and I went to a conference at Saddleback Church um, in California. And um, there they had two ideas uh, for how to help AIDS orphans. One was um, you can, the biggest one actually was to build orphanages. And the second one was, well, you can adopt. And um, so my experience, and it sort of, it, you know, I, I I think anyone who adopts a child is doing an amazing, selfless, great act uh, for, the, for the child. Um, but my experience in Africa was that with several million orphans, that th both of these solutions were really fraught with difficulty, to say it kindly. Um, so I was kind of outraged a little bit. And I said, that, you know, I really want to actually go back and see what uh, faith-based groups were doing in Africa. And if this, in fact, was um, what a lot of groups are doing, I wanted to report on it. Um, and so what I found was um, that there was definitely some of this going on, but I found actually many other stories. And let me just show you a couple of slides from just to sort of bring you into it. Um, okay, so this is, this is actually, I was hoping this would be the last slide. <laughs> no, that's not, that's not, okay, let's go here. So this is in Malawi. This is where we, I went with a photographer, Dominic Chavez, who took this picture and other pictures. Um, and this um, it's just some girls at a place um, that you saw this the man before David Nixon who's the, the main character in the book um, he's, he started this church let's go to the next one here's a, um, a church that where, where he, he built he built like seven buildings on his on his property and um, and one of them was for worship next one and here, here's a better look a bit at the property. These, the, the buildings are where he, had, he, he, um, he built a school for about 350 kids. The next one. And that's the cover of the book, actually. It shows um, uh, at, at the end of days, there was usually a celebration and great singing and joy and, and all. Let's go to the last one. So David Nixon. So. Um, you know, I, when I'm looking for to tell a story, I need a very compelling character. And, and Nixon, um, uh, I met him uh, one morning. It was like my second day in Malawi, and, the, and a government official said I should really meet this American guy who was just full of energy and drive and was going to do, was, was trying to do the right thing. But Nixon came into Malawi wanting to build an orphanage. And, um, and he actually started uh, doing that, some, made some buildings, uh, had some local partners, actually went out and bought a couple hundred mattresses, uh, was all set to do it. Then he went in to sort of tell the, the, head, of, um, uh, the head of social rehabilitation or in, in, uh, in one of the departments in the government in Malawi, his plans to sort of to try to get to show what great work he was doing. And the government official said, stop. We don't need this. And in fact, where you're doing this, what we really need is a school. Um, we, we need, and we need many schools. So don't do this. I don't want you to do it. So David Nixon went out, was devastated, and and then um, thought about it for a day or two and realized that the government official was right. And not only was he right, but he should be listening to the government official anyway, because that's because that's what the gov that's what the country wants. So he re he redid his whole plan and decided to do build these these. Um, school for 350 kids at its height. Um, and the day I met him, uh, we met in this little bed and breakfast we were staying, and he came in, and he was just very quiet, and he started talking, and then he just burst out in tears. And, um, and I said, well, what's, what happened? And he just told the story about a child 
that he had been sort of nursing through this uh, child who had who had HIV, nursing through a very difficult time in the hospital, and the night before, the child had died. And um, this was, hi, Ray. <laughs> um, this was um, incredibly devastating uh, to him. Um, and so he, he cried for pretty much the next hour. You know, to, to him, this child was someone, he thought about Jesus when he thought of this child. He thought about the, the life that was lost, that didn't have to be lost. And, and um, so he blamed himself. So, I, so immediately, so here I am as a journalist, okay, trying to think what I'm doing, trying to find a story. And I have someone in front of me who not only has admitted that in the past that he's made mistakes and learned from them, but also has showing such deep conviction and deep emotion uh, and commitment to what he was doing. I mean, I found, my, I found a book in front of me. Um, and I went on and, uh, um, and met dozens of other people doing all kinds of good and bad things, or quote unquote good or bad things, all with, with big hearts, all trying to do the right thing. Because it's incredibly difficult to do this kind of work. You know, even for people based in, in these communities, it's incredibly difficult to, to take such, um, uh, to deliver on, on your vision. And for a person from a foreign culture to deliver on his vision, um, if someone can do it, that story should be told. So my book, instead of coming from being outraged at what happened to Saddleback, was sort of, in a way, a celebration of someone who went, went from a beginning, a very difficult beginning, and then learned as he went, and then had some success at the end. So that was in a long-winded way of saying what, what was behind this book. Just a quick question. Did you know that first day that you met him that you'd be writing a book about him? And if not, how, how long did it take for you to, to read No, I mean, I, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, it wasn't a eureka moment. But, um, you know, I've been, a, like anyone, and you same with you, David. I mean, you've, you've, you've been telling stories for a long time. But you know when you meet a good storyteller. And... And when you meet them, you don't want to let them go. Um, because they can give you insights into, into life that you'd never learn. So um, I knew I had to come back to him. I wanted to keep exploring. I wanted to find to get much more context and perspective. So along those same lines, what advice would you give to nonprofit organizations about using stories and storytelling to, to raise their issues, in particular uh, with faith-based organizations or small organization. So you're going to hear from, from my two panelists some very specifics uh, that will be very helpful to you um, uh, based on their experience. And, and I can also later on talk about some of my experiences because I now work um, at the World Bank where we're trying to tell all kinds of stories. Um, and we're actually trying to work much more closely with faith-based groups um, uh, going forward. Um, but, you know, I think, I think, what, you, I think what you need to to do is, um, is, is figure out who your audience really is. And once you have your audience you know, pretty much set, it could be because you're doing a lot of advocacy work, that you're really looking to get funding, you're really looking to um, um, you know, just get more, a better a reputation around the world of, of the work that you're doing. Um, that that then, then, then you look for um, uh, stories directed at those audiences. So if you're working and you're, you're trying to get funding from a Canadian government, say, um, you look at, at where the intersection is about what, what their interests are and what you're doing to tell stories. So you're very strategic about how you tell stories and in where you tell them and to make sure that your audience gets the story. So it's, it's a, this is very sim simplifying it, but there are plans that can be done that can really get to the key audiences that you want. Now, before we, before we move on to, to, to the others, I, I have to ask John about uh, the president of the World Bank's recent uh, commitment to ending poverty by 2030. Is that right, 2030? Uh, one of the most audacious uh, goals in international development. I, I don't expect you to tell me how he's going to solve end poverty in 30 <laughs> seconds, but I'd like to know how you're communicating that, that story and, that issue, which is so complex. Yeah, well, there are, there are a couple of things going on. I'll be very brief. So first, 
Oh, sorry, yeah. Is that better? Sorry. Um, a couple of things going on. One is um, that the World Bank has, as many of you know, has um, an abundance of economists. And, and because there are an abundance of economists, there is, there is um, you know, people in many, in many ways believe um, that what, is, what comes out of the World Bank in studies that are vetted by multiple, multiple departments and people, there is some weight to them. So that the World Bank comes out and says we can, it's not just the World Bank, by the way, it's the global community, it's countries really leading the way for ending poverty. But if the World Bank says it's possible, then that makes people sit up and, and listen. And, um, and so wh what happened right away with this, very importantly, where there's some outside validators the New York Times ran a story quoting economists saying, actually, you know, this can happen. And it can happen because the growth rates in the last 20 years have, last 20 years have been so great that, that one country, China, has lifted so many hundreds of million people out of poverty that we know where the remaining 1.2 billion people in poverty are. Countries, in many of those cases, have plans to lift them out. We can redirect our programs to more uh, accurately, uh, you know, to address the, where, where these, these huge pockets of poverty are. And if, if the growth rates continue, the big, a big if in this equation, then there's a really good chance that we'll get down to sort of what we call frictional uh, poverty by 2030, which is in 17 years. And by the way, we're gonna measure it every year. So every year the World Bank's gonna come out and to see how the world is doing in ending poverty. So it's not some far off goal, it's a year to year goal to see what the progress is. And we're measuring poverty, but we're also measuring inequality in a sense by, by looking at the, pot, the bottom 40% of the population and how they are doing compared to the rest of the society. So it's not, and we launched this April 2nd, and we, have, we had a, a communications plan that went up to there, and now it's, what day is today? No, it's June 9th or something, two months later. And we have had, from that day, we have had a plan that went step by step by step about how, how we're advancing this message. We even have things like um, a two-word slogan, which is end poverty. And we put banners in front of our building from you know, 13 stories down to the, the bottom. And we have little pins that say end poverty. It's a great message. It's something that you remember. And if someone asks me what I do, I say we're working to end poverty. And something that we actually hope all of you say you, you'll do. Because that's the idea. It's not the World Bank ending poverty. It's all of us in this field working toward that goal. Great. Thanks, John. So now we move to Adrian. Uh, Adrian, uh, like all of us, is a professional communicator. But he's a little bit different because he also has fundraising responsibilities. So I'd like to find out how you use stories at CMMB to, to raise funds for your well, in our organization, our communicators are fundraisers, too. We use the term advancement because everybody in our organization is trying to advance uh, us forward through generational revenue, but also through brand awareness and communication. So we're a 100-year-old international uh, NGO located in New York. Uh, we're independent. We're Catholic. And we have our, our mission, vision, and values on the next slide that give you a sense of who we are. And we have a number of programs on the next slide that are comprehensive related to HIV, related to maternal and child health, and we deliver about $300 million worth of medicine to the developing world every year through our medical volunteer program. We have about 40 or 50 long-term medical volunteers who help us in the field integrate the medicines into these programs. And yesterday we had some great presentations from Sarah Melillo on our HIV AIDS program in Africa, Dr. Claudia Lanson, who talked about the maternal and child health work we do in Peru. So we're very much involved here with CCIH and what we're doing. And we take all of these interventions and we try and find stories to engage our donors. The next slide shows you a story that I wanted to highlight a little bit to you. It comes from Kenya. And you can see, as we, do, as we um, create something like this, we want to know who our audience is. And you can see in the top picture, Sister Claire at the Motomo uh, Mission Hospital in southern Kenya, caring for a mother and her child. And the mother came in one night at 2 o'clock, and one of our medical volunteers who had just come to the field was amazed to find the state of 
uh, the medical situation there and exclaimed, you know, if, if we only we had the resources like we did in the United States, boy, we could have made a difference. She came in, had a C-section, she was bleeding out, and fortunately, our medical volunteer knew what to do and trained some of the local staff in ways to do it. So it's a success story, and it's authentic. And you can see the quote pull out here. It appeals, it brings you in, it personalizes the work. So we know our audience is a Catholic audience primarily, but not exclusively. So Sister Claire is in the picture. It brings them in. It talks about our medical volunteers in the field. Our donors give money to us because they can't do, do, do that. They can't take the time. They don't have the, the resources to go do that. So they will give us their resources as a proxy. It's a big appeal to us. And then what we'll do is we'll take this message and repurpose it across many challenge channels. This channel is direct mail. And you probably all heard about the demise of direct mail and how this is going to die and everybody's going to you know, pull out their phones and that's all we're gonna do. That's greatly exaggerated. Direct mail is still one of the most effective ways to engage donors in the United States, North America. So we will use this specifically. We send this out to about 60,000 of our donors. We get about a 5% response. We'll generate maybe um, a four to one return on this. And it only costs us about 20 cents on the dollar to do this. So that's pretty nice. But then if you repurpose this, the next slide will show, we will now repurpose the story for many different channels. First for our website, you can see the uh, circled story, same mom and her child. We repurpose it for the website. It brings people in through that medium. Then we have the Facebook. Facebook, a very tight message, a little bit more personalized, a little bit more succinct, but also geared for a younger audience. And then the tweet. The tweet really boils it down. You've only got those characters to be able to really crystallize that story. And then the next, uh, the next slide is the potential stories that we're looking for. Uh, now we're really starting to get into the next level of digital work. And you really have to be able to come up, as John's saying, with the tight phrase, the sound bite that's going to bring people in. So this one is, when I grow up. And the real story here is that if you don't help, I won't grow up. And here are some opportunities for our children that we help, what they aspire to be with the resources necessary. So this has a real emotional appeal. This will get the response that we need and we'll be able to repurpose that over many channels. That's a, a great example of how a small organization small organization, not in, in FCs, MMB is not necessarily small, but repurposing material, you, use, you develop it once and then you use it in multiple formats is a, is a great idea for, for any organization. Um, Adrian, you've spent much of your career with faith-based organizations. How has your faith and the faith of people you're trying to reach influenced how you do your work? Well, I think, you know, one of the things that we heard a little bit at the conference as people were talking about the Catholic community is that we have a specific set of uh, morals and guidelines and the like. But really the bottom line is that we help people without discrimination around the world. We are going to help anybody who comes in. We're going to do it for free and we're going to do it to the best of our ability. That's the way I try to work uh, with my team and what I do. And not worry about who's on the other end, but really try to help people. And so... When we're sitting around our team and we're looking for our stories, we feel like we're part of the work and that we're trying to find the most authentic voice, the most per persuasive way to deliver it, and the most effective and cost-effective way to do it. Um, who, who are your donors and what do donors want to hear from an organization? Are, are all of your uh, financial supporters individuals? A large part of our, uh, of our base is individuals. As I, as I said, we raise about $350 million a year. A large part of that is in medicine, but about the, the 25 to $30 million a year we raise, 80% of that is from individuals. We also get some government support. We work with many of you as partners through USAID, CDC. We get some corporate foundation support, but the large part of the relationships we build are with individuals. And that's where we see a lot of the private support that comes through. 
Now, you're, you're in charge of fundraising and communications, and I, it sounds like the, you uh, implement those in a very integra integrated way. But are all of your communications fundraising, or do you also do other types of communications? Well, I'm, I'm how, biased how in the regard that all the communications we do are related to generating revenue, but they can be repurposed for many different things. So when we're looking for a story, I want something that can cut across all the channels. But we do a lot of work in advocacy. We do a lot of work for uh, cultivation. We do a lot of work for solicitation. A large part of the work we do is stewardship. So finding that story is really telling a story about what your work has been able to do for us. Government, corps, founds, orgs, individuals coming back because that, that's going to bring them right back into the cycle of saying, boy, that really was a valuable investment. I'd like to, to re-up. Okay. Thank you, Adrian. Um, now we're going to go to uh, Rebecca, and she's going to talk a bit about social media. That's a big part of what you do. So how do you use social media to tell a story, and what is your goal when you post something through social media? So um, a lot about, can you guys hear me? A lot of what I do is um, promote the work that we do, <laughs> um, which is uh, mainly knowledge management around um, family planning and reproductive health um, at the Knowledge for Health Project. And so, go back. Okay, so our story is really about brand awareness and who we are. So this is kind of, I don't know if you can see what the words are because they're kind of small, but these are like the adjectives that describe who we are. So when I'm creating a story on Facebook or I'm putting a message out, I wanna make sure that I fit into this kind of uh, list of adjectives that explains who we are. We're trustworthy, we're non-biased, we, you know, we're a place that people go to get information and mostly health information around family planning, reproductive health, HIV, malaria, a ver and a, a variety of other issues. So I, I make sure that I follow these things. Um, sometimes I'm sharing a story from another organization who's talking up from the field, but a lot of it is sharing information that other people have created. So I just try to make sure that I stay in line with, like, you know, I kind of painted a picture of who we are as an organization, and, and I like to keep the story in line with that. Um, and the goal that I have when I post something onto social media um, is to really get information out. So. It's about sharing information. Sometimes it's just general health information messages. Sometimes it's health promotion. Sometimes it's advocacy around a particular um, global health day. Um, but it's really sharing information. So I'm not trying to get you to give me money. I'm not trying to get you to buy anything um, unless it's a healthy lifestyle. Um, but I'm really just trying to get you to take the information that I have on various different products that we create and take it and use it to help people. Um, so sometimes it's a little bit hard to do that because we don't really want too much for, from you. If I'm asking you to buy something, if I'm asking you to donate, it's a little bit easier to you know, monetize that and have a return on investment because I can say, all right, we sent out you know, message to 4,000 people, 5, 000, you know, five people responded, whatever, I can monetize that. But it's a little hard when all I want you to do is just take the information and, and use it. So that's our main goal. Um, and I work on a couple different projects and that's basically what we do is share information. We really want people to be a little bit more engaged and that's something that we're really working on now. Um, I want you to see the information, I want you to share it, I want you to talk about it. Um, so I want you to click, I want you to share, I want you to talk, I want you to comment. Um, and that's really where we're trying to strengthen. So that's the engagement bit of social media and that's definitely a little bit harder. Um, and I'll have an example later that kind of and didn't you have more to say about uh, what small organizations can do with limited capacity? Yeah, you can go which we to that. Yeah. So, um, sorry, this is again small, but this is um, my image is about not jumping in before you test the waters. Um, so, you know, you really want to come up with this plan, right? So, um, John had mentioned before, you know, what are your objectives? I think. You know, when we create any kind of programming around public health, um, we really think of, okay, there's a problem, um, malaria is spreading. Uh, so we wanna prevent malaria, that's, that's our objective. So we wanna think about using social media in that same context. You wanna think about what you're, what, what's your problem? What are you trying to solve? And then work down and think of what your resources are, what you can afford to spend, maybe who are you trying to reach um, is a really big one. That's one that I really wanna stress who your audience is. Um, there's a program that we have 
that we help with in Swaziland, and it's HIV prevention. And they really wanted a Twitter page. Like, really, they wanted Twitter so bad when I got there. And we talked about it a lot, and I said, well, do you use Twitter? And none of them use Twitter. And I said, do you think that the people in, that Twitter is really big in Swaziland? And they were like, I don't know. And I said, well, why do you want to use Twitter then? Um, so we ended up not using Twitter. And um, the other thing was there was very limited resources there. The communications person there, which was great that we even had one, was doing a million different things. Um, so we did end up having a Facebook page because that was something that she felt competent to manage on her own. And it was effective at reaching the population she was looking to reach. So I really think focusing on your audience and what you're trying to accomplish. And I, I think when people always ask this question to me, like, what should I do? How should I do it? Um, and I think they want me to give them like a silver bullet. Like, what's the best platform? What should I use? Um, and I don't think that there is one. Um, as much as social media is what I do every day, I don't always think it's the right thing to do. Um, so, you know, really think through your plan because um, that is going to make the best bang for your buck. If you can repurpose stories, again, that's great. Um, but I, I do strongly suggest not using exactly the same thing, exactly the same way on everything you use. Really make sure you're using it the right way. Uh, Rebecca, I used to work for a large uh, US NGO, and we occasionally get requests from the field from people saying, oh, we want to put out a press release. And I would say, well, who's your audience? And they would say, oh, um, I don't know, we hadn't really thought of that. I said, well, figure out who your audience is and then we'll write the press release, so same idea. So tell us a little bit more about the social media, specific social media um, uh, sites that you use and how you use them. Yeah. Um, so this is just a brief, really brief um, breakdown and I kind of put the pros and cons to each one that, that I use regularly and there are very many, but these are three of, the, the most popular ones that are being used, especially in the global health and international development community. Um, and I think they all have benefits and strengths, and, and I think it really goes back to my point before. Use the one that works best for you, for the audience you're trying to reach, for what you're trying to do. Um, I think Twitter is really great um, at connecting, especially on this inter-organization level as well. Um, I've had donors ask, well, I really want the way that I can see you doing social media best would be if you sent out a tweet and then a person on the ground in Kenya wrote back and said, we're out of supplies at this NGO. And I was like, that is great. That would be great. But I think, <laughs> um, I think we're not quite all the way on the ground with all of this yet. I think it's happening, and I think it's more so than it was before. But I think if that's your goal, that might not be the best way to get there. Um, I brought that example up at a, a working group meeting that um, I have the Social Media for Global Health Working Group, which if you're interested, let me know. All of you are welcome to join. It's um, an interagency working group in DC, Baltimore area, but we have a list of people from all over the world um, that talk about social media and global health and some of these issues, what platforms to use, how to create a good plan. Um, but at that meeting they said, they thought of all these questions, like if you had that person on the ground tweet, that there was no, um, let's say, a particular medicine they needed in a clinic in Kenya, how would you respond to that? Would you be able to get them in contact with the people that needed it? You're not the person who would get the medicine there. Maybe I'd have to tweet you, right? Like, so you know, thinking through that that whole like why we're doing it is really important. Um, so Twitter short bursts of information, um, good for your population if that's where they are. Um, Facebook. You can create a little bit longer messages and you can be more personable. Um, and it's one of the top sites throughout the world. I remember someone had showed me a graphic once that said um, Facebook starting to surpass Google as the number one website people go to throughout the world, which is pretty, pretty intense, right? That's like a search website, you know? Um, and, but knowing that Facebook is not going to show everyone all of your messages, for those of you who use Facebook, especially on a professional level, um, some of your stuff is not going to show up anymore because of s some algorithms and money things. and So that's another issue. Um, and then fa LinkedIn is very much more professional based. So, you know, I'm connecting with you professionally. You can create smaller groups around topics and things like that, but it might not be the way that you're going to connect with, um, you know, a lay person on the ground who's not um, in the professional world in, in that sense. OK, 
Okay, so um, one of the programs that we have, that we work on, it's kind of like a subcontract that we have um, in our building. We do way more than we even have, I think, the capacity for sometimes, but is with the Association of Medical Laboratory Scientists of Nigeria and e-learning. Um, and we've created this, we've, I wonder if that's mine. Um, <laughs> And we've created um, an e-learning platform for them to get um, kind of like their continuing medical education that we would have here. Um, we've created a bunch of e-learning um, e courses for them. Well, courses was hard for me, but. Um, so we wanted to be able to keep track of them and have them share this information among e each other. Um, and so my coworker who works on the ground with them in Nigeria and helped build all these courses found that they, a lot of them are really actively involved in Facebook. So they built this page. It's been up less than six months. It has, it's an open group on Facebook. It has almost 4,000 members, which is huge. Um, if you know anything about Facebook and trying to get any kind of engagement, it's, it can be really challenging. There's 4,000 members and they engage. They share the page with fellow colleagues. They make sure that they're all taking these courses, which was the kind of objective to starting the page was to get people actively taking these courses, right? The objective for the project was like to get something like, I wanna say 3,000 people taking courses out of like 6,000 members of this organization. And you know, they'll invite their friend and their friend will come on and say, what's this about? I wanna take this e-learning course. And then someone will respond, oh, you have to go to this site and register here. And then someone will say, I tried to register. And it's like, ongoing, people every day, all day, talking about e-learning, which is anybody really, I mean, I don't know if you guys feel like really like you wanna talk about e-learning like on a regular basis, but this is really important to them and it's, it's something that, you know, they found there was this gap and they really wanted to be able to, you know, continue their education and we helped them do that and, you know, they helped build the courses and they basically self-moderate this page, which has been really great. One thing we also found is that most of them are accessing it through their phones, um, which when you're using a platform, you wanna make sure you know how people are accessing it. Um, and they didn't know what they were accessing at first. Like they would come on and say, this is a great page, but what's it for? Because on their mobiles, on their Blackberries, or on their, you know, I call them not so smartphones, but they're like smartphones, but they're not iPhones or Androids. They're just like the one below that. They didn't know what the heck the site was about. So, you know, through the process, they kept figuring out what needed to be, how it needed to show so people knew what they were on. Um, and it just built this great community, which number one, I wanna say, was a very strong community beforehand. So that's, that's a plus. That's an easy way to engage people who are already really engaged with each other. Um, and they were actively using Facebook. So they took an, we took an audience that was already very engaged. We put them on a site that they were already kind of on and we made a specific um, group for that. So that's part of the reason why we were so successful, or that's pretty much all the reason why we were so successful. Um, and I think all of these different ways of connecting are gonna be successful when you pick the right thing for the right. Have I said that yet? For the right thing. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Um, can I also say that if you're not already following CCIH, uh, CCIH is on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, so please follow us there if you are on any of those sites. So I think we'll open it up for, for questions from you. Uh, if you have a question, introduce yourself and indicate whether the question is directed toward a specific person. Question. My name is Jen Masiga. I work with a church uh, NGO in Kenya uh, called MEDS. Uh, we've been trying to think of uh, reaching a, a wider audience, and we thought of the social media like Facebook. But what MEDS management thought is that because you can get feedback from uh, the audience, then if any organization would want to put uh, negative information about you, they can put in the same media, and that could spoil the image of the organization. So it can also be used to fight you back. What would you say that, about that? 
Um, so I've heard, we actually wanted to have a session on this coming up for um, my working group, but I've heard from people that there is no negative attention as good attention because it's attention. Um, I think any time I've ever gotten anything negative, and I wanna say that it's been very rarely, um, Again, this comes from the fact that we're non-biased and we don't, we really just push information out. We don't have strong opinions either way, but um, I've always responded to everything. Um, and this goes into like having time to do it. If you're gonna put it up and not monitor it, then it's probably not a good idea. Um, but I wouldn't delete negative comments. I would respond to them. Um, I remember I'd posted something that said, it was, it was negative, but it was true. It was something like the worst place the worst place to have a baby. I don't know if you've seen this, like the state of the world's um, women or children. The report came out, actually the one that came out last year from Save the Children. And I posted something, the worst place to have a child in the world is like Nigeria or something. And I got this response, that's not helpful. You shouldn't post that, it's so negative. That's my country, like very strongly worded. And I realized, like, you're right, like it's a negative thing. And so I asked, how would I, how would I, how could I put this information up? And say the same thing, but still, but have a more hopeful view or not be offensive. And they wrote something back and, and we had this great dialogue. And I was thrilled because it's engagement, right? Even if it's negative, like I was so happy to have someone be like, you're wrong. So I could say, you're right, you know, you're right, I am wrong, like let's have a conversation about it. Um, and I think, it, you know, it is a space that people can post anything. Um, I've definitely gotten really great, sometimes I don't think people realize that it's public. Um, I've had people ask me the craziest questions like personal medical questions, and I've been like, you should go to your doctor now. Um, also, I know who you are, this isn't anonymous. Like, you're not, um, but, you can, but you can respond, you know? You can respond to everything, you can, be, you can be honest, you can ask them, you know, why they feel that way, you can take it as opportunity to show how great you are, right? You're telling me this negative thing about my organization. Let me tell you how great we are, right? And, and you're not just saying it to say it, you have a reason to. So I think it's a really great opportunity. And, you know, and to engage that person a lot more. Sure. Let me just add one thing too, so as you're building the, the case with your leadership about having a Facebook page, is that if you have an organizational Facebook page, you can moderate it. You can uh, make sure that you're getting the right messages through. But I think Rebecca's point is a good one, that you do want to engage in the conversation. But there are ways, best practices that you can read about and share that you'll be able to moderate it in such a way that you'll be able to get your message across and show what a great organization you are. Yeah, that, that fear of negative comments is one uh, justification that senior management often makes in not going into social media. I don't think that should be the reason. There may be other reasons why Twitter is not the right fit for you or Facebook's not the right to fit, but I don't think that should be the deciding factor because those, the, those conversations will go on whether you have a Facebook account or not. But if you have on Facebook, then as they said, you can try to shape the conversation. I have a question. My name is Mona Bormitt. I work at CCIH. John, this question is for you. Um, a lot of what we've been trying to do and talking to our members about is advocacy in the form of op-eds and letters to the editor um, and working with newspapers and other publications and as a former Porter. <laughs> I was wondering if you'd have any advice to us as Christians either reaching out as individuals to newspapers or as organizations. Um, so, so, so it's, it's whether you do it on your own or through, um, let, me, let me step back a little bit on that question because um, I think um, op-eds, um, op is very, very difficult actually to get placed in most places in the world. And um, if that's your strategy, um, you very well could have many failures in a row. So I would look actually more, thinking about it more as, uh, for blogs or um, even using Facebook or Twitter um, to get different things up. But blogs, th there are some platforms um, that you can get like Huffington Post, that you can get um, dedicated site, a place, place them for, and then post it yourself. Um, I mean, we, we tried, uh, just to give you one example, um, so Jim Kim, the World Bank President, and Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, went on this historic trip to Africa. And um, uh, 
uh, to the Great Lakes region just two weeks ago. And so we wrote an op-ed for that, okay, from airing the dirty laundry here. But the, um, um, and, uh, and we tried a, a bunch of s serious places, and, well, not a bunch, maybe two or three, and it just, it just didn't make it for us. So just, just to think about that. I mean, it's a really high bar for an op-ed. So maybe it's a reflection of um, the writers. That's depressing. But, um, <laughs> that was co-authored by the president and the secretary yeah. general. Yeah. Yeah. So think about creating your own content and, and finding ways of, of placing it yourself. You can also place it on your own website, which, and then you can send that out to the audience that you want to. Hi, Rebecca. This is Jean Sack from Japico. Okay. Um, my question is about reprocessing and renewing old information. Okay. Thank you very much She's for this. She's holding up a K for Health um, right. mouse pad. Now, you too, those I didn't of you break. in this uh, audience can have this. <laughs> you too could have the French version of the Family Planning Manual. But of course, it's on uh, the web for about 20 languages. Yeah. 20 languages. I'm talking about your language. It's also in English. Now, I'm going to be taking these to Burundi, OK? You two could be taking them back. They're not so heavy. Um, but that's old news. That's the 2011 version. Uh, how do you reprocess and renew resources that are really valuable for medical schools, midwifery schools, nursing schools that are teaching from 30-year-old curriculum, just disc, and this could be so valuable. Um, well, in terms of the family planning handbook, which, thank you for holding that up, Jean. Um, the family planning handbook is um, one of the products that uh, the team that I work with helped create. It's um, just a great manual on different family planning methods, and it, it's with the WHO, and it's it's great. Um, and with something like that, we actually had to redo it um, and update it and make sure it was new. And it's a really intense process, especially because you have to translate it into you know, a bunch of different languages. Um, I think repurposing information that's still valid, whether it's five years old or it's new, um, I think that's fine. I think you can, you can still do that. Um, with the toolkits that we use on the k for health website, we have a process where we, so the toolkits are these little tiny you know, uh, packages of information on different topics, different uh, projects use them, different, so we have one, we even have one I think on H, uh, F, FBOs and HIV prevention and maybe Swaziland or South Africa. But we have a bunch of different pieces of information and one thing we do when we have people set up a, a toolkit is we make sure that they have a plan to review it and renew it um, every year. So. If it's something that's gonna change very often, and some of the information that we talk about doesn't change that much. Um, and I don't think it makes it, some of the health promotion materials we use do need to be updated, and I think some of them are good still and still have messages to share. Um, you wanna make sure that what you're sharing is up to date though, um, for sure, that it's not something that, a method, if it's in terms of family planning, if it's a method that no longer exists, that's. That's obviously not something you want to share. Um, so you want to make sure that things are up to date in that regard. But if you can have a plan when you create something, I mean, we have sustainability plans, hopefully, when we go into countries with different programs and projects, we should have that with our com communication resources as well. One, one small idea would be, um, if you're going to Burundi, is that where you say you're going? Yeah. So going to Burundi, um, and you want to launch this in a country, you can do a, a short video about it. And then, and then have that come out, uh, promote it, and bring in your 2011 report, and it will all seem very new. Put that on my Facebook. Yeah, what, what were you going to do with these? Well, where would you put that, John? You can, um, you know, for instance, if you want to, if you're launching a, a whole curriculum that will that will help in the um, healthy delivery of babies. Okay, in a country. And so you can then release that to the whole media in the country, in Burundi, okay, with the, with the video, with maybe uh, a, press, a, a press conference when you go into the country to release a video. You're coming in with this report, you're bringing it to Burundi for the first time, and, um, and get coverage for that. You also have a meeting with, obviously, your officials and the like. But you show the video everywhere you go, including 
um, as you go into different health centers where you're hoping that, that the providers will pick it up. And you'd also put it on YouTube and you would promote it through your social media and your partner's social media. And the other, the other thing is that a lot of funders are no longer funding those kinds of resources unless there's a digital deployment for that as well. So you need to have it digitally from the very beginning, from the time you're thinking about renewing the, the, the resource, that there's a digital way to deliver it so that it'll be easier in the future to update and then deliver. So I think at the beginning, as you're conceptualizing any kind of manual or things, you really need to think about the digital deployment of that. Uh, about the question from Mona earlier about um, getting edit, uh, letters to the editor and things like that, I was just thinking as you were saying local um, media, that we found at CCP in general that like the local media has been really, um, really great at getting things out for us. Like I, I find it harder to get an article in um, a newspaper or in, in some kind of conglomerate here in the US, but this the medical laboratory scientists, we were in four different newspapers online there. Like, so you can reach out to your local media too, and I think that they're, they're, they might be more likely to, have, to spread your message for you and to, and to be involved in that, just a thought. And I'm the lucky one. Um, I'm just dying to make this comment and I'd be very thrilled to get your feedback on this comment. Worked with a small organization where um, this is what the philosophy was that every individual in that organization is a fundraiser. As I said, uh, regardless of who you are and what your position is, use your Facebook and Twitter to just not ask for money, but these are your friends and your people in your, in your uh, groups. Just tell them what you're doing. You know, I just got back from Mozambique and in Shockway, we just found, uh, you know, a tremendous need for bed nets. I just uh, got a email from my friend who is visiting um, Swaziland or in this district or there, and she just distributed 1,000 bed nets, and that made such a big difference. Or so many tube wells or hand pumps have been um, installed in Cambodia and so forth. I'm just giving you some examples. And never ask for money, but just tell them, you know, what a great organization yours is. And your friends and, and people in your group are the ones who's gonna send to your organization or look you up in the organization, hey, my friend is doing some great job and I connect with that. I'd like to fund uh, this organization that my friend belongs to and is distributing bed nets or installing uh, hand pumps and so forth. So let me just pledge for $20 a month or something. You know, Very small amount of money, but that adds up. Uh, I'd like to get your reaction to that and see you know, if that really is a good strategy. <laughs> that's, a home, that's a home run. I mean, we'd call that advancement. And that's what we try to do. Everybody in the organization is involved in advancement because it helps the, the health of your organization, it tells the stories, and it engages all of our network. So that, I couldn't have said it better. That's absolutely critical, and that's what we try to do. And then you have different ways to engage people after they show some affinity. And you can bring them in at a very modest monthly gift, which becomes a long-term value to the organization. And then creating that personal relationship, that relational model to what happens in the field, engages them, engages their communities, their parishes, their networks. It's, it's very powerful what you're saying. So thank you. Our timekeeper says we have five more minutes. So yeah. this lady here. My name is Dr. Elder, a coach, and my question is for John. About the book that you, you wrote about David Nixon, who was your audience, and how was the book distributed, and how, how did it reach the intended audience? Um, so I, I saw the audience as uh, more general public. Beacon uh, Press was, was the publisher. Um, but the hunger for, for, for the information in the book, I think, is, is largely in the faith-based community. Um, but I, I intended, and maybe not as successfully as I hoped, that it really reached far beyond that, that, that actually it was an exposure for a, a you know, much larger audience to see what faith-based groups are doing in Africa in particular. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, the, the question is on the transition to digital media. Uh, many of us work with, uh, in areas where uh, digital access isn't quite as convenient as it is here. Uh, 
And so sometimes the form factor for you know, providing a book, uh, maybe it's easier, better for the recipient to have it in a book than to have it online. But uh, there, there is a transition going on. And I'm just wondering if you would comment on sort of the, the pace and that sort of thing about um, what, what we should anticipate. Um, I think, you know, I think it definitely goes back to the audience thing, you know, having what you need for your audience. But I also think that a lot of times we assume what our audience has, but we don't think it through. Um, I know before I got into international development, I probably didn't have any idea what anyone was doing on the ground, in, especially in low resource settings. Um, I think you can't assume. I think people, there's more phones than toilets. Um, I think that's, that boggles my mind every time I think about it. Um, it just, I mean, just think about that. That's like, you can use the phone, but there's nowhere for you to go to the back. Like, I just, that's crazy to me. Um, so I think that's one thing, you know, we definitely need to think about is uh, that there's more going on than we think. Um, and I also, from a personal perspective, watching this happen for the past few years, um, I think it's happening quicker to some degree. Definitely in lower resources countries, there's so much of a need that it's moving so quickly. Um, you know, we always have these conversations here, you know, in the United States where we're like fighting with our managers over whether we should start a Twitter page when like, you know, they want it so bad when there's so much, you know, they're so, the resources are so low there. If something's quick and easy and, and they can have it, they can have information quickly and easily, they're jumping at it. They don't, they're not thinking about it. They're moving forward so quickly. Um, the innovation that's happening, especially in Africa right now is crazy. Things are changing. The, and innovating so quickly. So I think don't assume that you know what's going on before you um, think about it. I also am a real proponent of survey research and doing formative research before you spend a lot of money to, to implement something. Really find out what people are using. Print a book if you have to print a book. I mean, and make an electronic version that's downloadable for people who can do that. I mean, people will go to an internet cafe and they'll download something onto a flash drive or they'll, you know, We've provided um, those small go-to PC um, netbooks to people in, in developing world, and they've, like, it's like a light, you know, light in the dark. Like, we don't even care if we have these for two years. You're helping me make, do my work so much. So I think there are ways to do things cheaper than we used to. It's easier, um, but sometimes sending paper is, is sending paper, and it's the right thing to do. The, pa the pace is phenomenal, so. I agree with you, Rebecca, that the phone the phone thing is the, the difference. So the digital stuff is, and we have a doctor in the Nuba Mountains who is the only doctor for 400 square miles. He oversees, you know, 300 bed. He's got two iPads and he has better Wi-Fi than I do. And, and it's unbelievable. There are no other resources. They're worried about getting food in there. But he is sending us photos and stories and, you know, telemedicine. The whole thing is happening unbelievably. Well, I think we'll have to leave it for you. One more question? Okay, one more question. Um, I hear you talking mostly to the English-speaking audience. What barriers do you cross with trying to reach a more global community that doesn't speak English? Um, there are definitely programs now. I know I'm thinking of, um, I think, Text for Baby in um, Bangladesh, where they sent all their texts that are going out in Bangla. Um, and the same, we have a toolkit that's in Bangladesh. We made the entire thing with their help, and it's all in Bangla. I think, you know, again, if, you, if you're doing some research and finding out what languages they're using, maybe they're using broken English, but, you know, the, the keyboard on the phone kind of dictates how, sometimes how they're gonna communicate. So, depending on how you're connecting with them and, and what you're trying to get across. I think that you can do this internationally. Um, a lot of people are using English in, in various different countries to spread these messages and have been very effective. Um, but I think language is definitely another one of those things to put in your formative research um, category. If, if they're not connecting in English, um, there's a Facebook in, I'm pretty sure, almost every country. Um, so th that's definitely an option. John, do you know how many languages uh, World Bank tweets in? <laughs> I bet it's a bunch. We both have a lot of languages. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I have this Yeah, I'm not sure. We, but we do all our press releases in at least seven languages. Um, 
so, but we, we've done things in, in more than 20 languages as well. Well, thank you all for coming. I want to uh, thank John Donnelly, Rebecca Shore, and Adrian Kerrigan. And I also want to thank, thank Kathy Erb for organizing this session. Thank you. She did all the heavy lifting. Thank you very much.